The year 1900 saw the initial move to establish what was to become one of the country's largest glass factories, the Cambridge Glass Company. Although attempts have been made as early as 1873 to start a glass house in Cambridge, it wasn't until the Cambridge Improvement Company tried to attract a glass company to Cambridge that a factory in the city finally materialized. Part of the success of convincing the National Glass Company to build their plant in Cambridge was a $30,000 bonus and 10 acres of land supplied by the Improvement Company. National Glass was also attracted to Cambridge by the area's railroad facilities and supply of cheap gas and coal. In anticipation of the new firm, the Cambridge Improvement Company, in its proposal to the people of Cambridge, stated the following about the Cambridge Glass Company. Quote, those who ought to know say this will be four times as big as the Biswell Glass Works, which has already required the building of 110 housed there. We estimate that the Cambridge factory will require the building of from 500 to 800 houses and will add from 2,500 to 3,000 to our population and will increase our wealth more than $1 million. End of quote. Ground was broken for the factory in the summer of 1901. It was also in 1901 that Arthur J. Bennett joined the sales staff of the National Glass Company. Bennett immigrated to the United States from England at the age of 20. In 1886, he affiliated himself with Jones, McDuff, and Stratton, as well as the Jordan March Company, both of Boston, before moving to New York City in 1896, where he eventually became employed by the National Glass Company. Sent to Cambridge in 1902, Bennett originally was employed as the new Glass Company sales manager, but soon became the firm's general manager. Bennett was active in many aspects of plant operation, including glass design. In fact, the first piece of glass turned out by the Cambridge Glass Company in May 1902 was a pressed water pitcher reputed to be designed by Bennett. The pitcher's glass pattern is known today as Big X. Many of the approximately 200 original workers, like Leo J. Du Bois, Jacob Franz, John Dagenhart, and Hugh and Walter McManus, had traveled to Cambridge from Findlay, Ohio, where glassmaking activities were dwindling due to the decreasing supply of natural gas. I'm Lydia Elizabeth McManus. My husband, Hugh McManus, made the first piece of Cambridge glass in 1902. I married Hugh in West Virginia in 1883 and the first of our eight children was born the following year. Hugh was working as a presser at a glass plant in Wellsburg, West Virginia. In 1888, about 150 workers from the Wellsburg factory moved to a glass house in Finley, Ohio. Then, as luck would have it, the supply of natural gas that was needed to fire the furnaces dwindled and the factory closed in 1901. Many of the glass workers and their families, including ours, moved to Cambridge, Ohio to work at the new Cambridge Glass Company that was being built. We had heard it was to be one of the most complete plants in the world. On May 20th, 1902, the first piece of Cambridge Glass was made by my husband, Hugh McManus, with our 16-year-old son, Walter, assisting at his side. How proud we were that day. A few months later, in early July, there was a devastating flood that surrounded the Cambridge Glass Company. Hugh did what he could to help the many glass house families in need, but sadly, late on the evening of July 4th, as Hugh was headed home, he fell from the railroad trestle in front of the glass house and drowned. I was devastated. Eight children to support and all alone. But I pulled myself together, and since my home was in the glass house edition of Cambridge, I began boarding glass workers to make ends meet. Times were hard, but by working together as a family, we pulled through. It was written in the Jeffersonian newspaper on September 4th, 1902. Quote, Beautifully situated in one of the suburbs of the city is the plant of the Cambridge Glass Company. It's not like an ordinary glass factory, but more like a residence or a college with a rolling lawn stretched all along the front of the plant. No one could imagine a more beautiful spot for a glass plant. People passing on the B&O trains always have some remark to make about the beautiful plant with its lawns and surroundings. Not only are the grounds of the best, but the entire plant is way beyond anything ever undertaken in the building of a glass factory. President Bennett says he wants to have the plant in such shape that every man that is employed at present will want to stay. 
He has a very good set of men, and reports say most will probably anchor for life in Cambridge. End of quote. I am Milton Conaway. I moved from Bridgeport to work at the Cambridge Glass Company. I had previous experience making glass and was trained in applying handles. Sticking a handle was my job at the Cambridge Glass Company. I lived in a house on Elm Street in the Glass House Edition where my son Earl Conaway was born in 1911. When Earl was a young lad, he worked as boy labor at the plant. The Cambridge Glass Company encouraged employees to stay in Cambridge, and we did. My name is Bessie Noble Mitchell. I was born in Cambridge in 1887. In 1903, at the age of 16, I went to work at the new Cambridge Glass Company factory. My job was to select doorknobs. For many local people, getting a job at this new state-of-the-art factory was considered a step up from farming or coal mining. Many girls, like myself, found our first jobs there. The workplace was also where many of us found romance. I met my future husband there. His name was Ross Mitchell, and he worked in the engine room. We married in 1907. Just down the road and across the railroad track, the Glass House Edition was being built. So many families moved to Cambridge for work that more housing was needed. Ross and I bought a parcel and built our new home there. We eventually had five children. Our first daughter, Mary Martha, was born in 1908. We were so proud of her. She became secretary to Mr. A.J. Bennett, owner of the Cambridge Glass Company, and later she became the last president of the company. I'm Ori Mosser. I started working at the Cambridge Glass Company on New Year's Day in 1904 as a gatherer. I began learning how to gather glass when I was 12 years old in a glass factory in Marietta, Ohio. In 1910, I became manager of the Biesville factory of the Cambridge Glass Company. Then in 1917, operations were transferred back to the main Cambridge plant where I became plant manager. Originally, the Cambridge Glass Company opened with only one furnace, although three were planned. In 1903, the second furnace was added and the third in 1905. During the company's formative years, many improvements and additions were made to the building including some of the earliest used producer machines to gasify coal for melting the glass in the furnaces and for heating the annealing layers. Coal was mined in the Cambridge area and the company took advantage of the natural resource. The company had its own coal mines, including one named Nearcut, after the early trademark and line of press tableware. It also developed its own productive gas fields. The factory had a labor gang that kept everything running smoothly. Cambridge's affiliation with the National Glass Company almost proved to be the death of the Cambridge Glass Company only a few short years after the glass house opened. Courageously, Arthur J. Bennett continued operations. Conditions were adverse, and the future of the plant was in doubt, but the operating company, represented in Mr. Bennett, carried on. In the scrambled financial troubles of the National Glass Company, it appeared at one time that Cambridge would lose its factory. Mr. Bennett went to Byesville, three miles south of Cambridge, and with the assistance of the townspeople, got control of the small plant there. It was smaller than the plant in Cambridge, but it was a factory where Mr. Bennett was safe from the financial alarms surrounding the closing days of the National Glass Company debacle. He transferred his works to Byesville in order to wait out the financial storm. In 1910, largely by investing his own personal savings, Bennett purchased the Cambridge Glass Company complex from the receivers of National Glass for a sum of between $400,000 and $500,000. When asked by a reporter in 1926 why he took on the financial responsibility of the company himself, Bennett replied that he had a well-defined idea of what he wanted to do and preferred to take the entire risk. Not only did the Cambridge Glass Company provide an industrial rock of Gibraltar for the city of Cambridge and the surrounding area, but it also provided a social consciousness. Cambridge Glass is one of the nation's first companies to provide for its workers insurance. During World War I, A.J. Bennett allowed a large lot behind the factory to be plowed, fertilized, and marked off into lots of 50 square feet. He gave these lots free of charge to his employees so they could raise gardens and provide for their families with food during a time of national crisis. 
This social consciousness was also seen among workers who, when community needs demanded, would form relief organizations in order to provide financial assistance, gather clothing, and distribute food baskets. Beyond the bread and butter needs of its workers, the Glassworks was also responsible for meeting many of the social and recreational needs of the Cambridge community. Numerous athletic teams, including baseball, football, and bowling, were sponsored. In fact, the Glassworkers' gridiron team was nicknamed the Nearcut Football Squad after the Cambridge Glass Company's early press glassware. Not only were there in-house rivals like Glassworkers versus mold makers, but also crosstown and interstate rivals. In addition to the many recreational opportunities provided for Cambridge Glass employees, Labor Day activities were organized by various Cambridge union locals, and they were also supported by the company. Activities of the day included music, picnicking, speech making, and other amusements like pie eating contests and sack races. Also included in the day's activities was a parade. As stated in the October 1916 issue of the American Flint, quote, Glassworkers held a successful Labor Day celebration. After the big street parade in the morning, they marched to the city park, headed by the Cambridge City Band, and the food baskets just rolled in. By noon, the park was well filled with people who came out with their whole family and friends to enjoy the day. End of quote. Decorating many Labor Day parade participants were handmade glass whimsies, such as canes, that the glassworkers made at the factory during lunch or after hours. In fact, in the 1906 Labor Day Parade, the Cambridge Glass Company float, the Near Cut, won top honors and was draped with a large canopy of glass chains. What was to be one of the hallmarks of Cambridge production, the creation of over 40 glass colors, started during the decade of World War I and continued into the 1920s. Among the early crystal and opaque colors introduced by Cambridge were azurite, ebony, helio, primrose, and rubina. These colors and others, along with innovative decorating techniques such as applied enameling, plate and needle etchings, and gold incrustation, gave Cambridge glass high marks in quality. During the 1920s, the company was very prosperous and gained much exposure, especially in the glass and ceramic trade journals. In December 1926, China Glass and Lamps devoted one of its largest features ever to the Cambridge Glass Company for its 25 years in the glassmaking industry. The feature states, quote, just what factor stands out in carrying a glassware factory through 25 years of operation? That factor is courage when the Cambridge Glass Company is considered. The fundamental quality of courage in the history of the Cambridge Glass Company must be added the grace of cooperation between leader and lieutenants. The leader gave of his best and his utmost and thus inspired his associates. The Cambridge Glass Company is preparing to celebrate the 25th anniversary of its first piece of glassware. For a quarter of a century, Arthur J. Bennett has guided his factory at Cambridge in Guernsey County, Ohio. It has grown steadily. Its products have a worldwide market, and yet the ideal of the best quality in glass still holds sway. Recent improvements in equipment, helping it overcome great difficulties and enabling it to steadily improve its product, in short, what makes it successful, perhaps often aroused interest and speculation, are counted upon to still facilitate the manufacture of glassware of ever-increasing quality." End of quote. Showrooms for the Cambridge Glass Company were established in New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, Denver, Philadelphia, and Dallas. At various times, representatives were also based out of Boston, Lancaster, Ohio, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, St. Louis, Missouri, Cincinnati, Ohio, Omaha, Nebraska, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Jacksonville, Florida, Indianapolis, Indiana, New Orleans, Louisiana, as well as Calgary and Toronto, Canada, London, England, Havana, Cuba, Melbourne and Sydney, Australia, and Wellington, New Zealand. At peak periods of employment, over 750 men and women were employed by the Cambridge Glass Company. Not only did this workforce include clerical and glass workers, it also included coopers, blacksmiths, chemists, engineers, and labor. Hello, my name is Jasper Starr. I started working at the Cambridge Glass Company in 1911. My first job was as a laborer, and I worked my way onto the laboring gang. 
By 1926, I was foreman of the laboring gang and stayed in that position until I retired in 1953. One of the most unusual things that happened to me at the factory was that one day I was working and was overcome by some sort of gas. My workers carried me outside and laid me on the ground. Then they covered me with sand from my neck to my feet. I soon recovered and was just fine. During my time at the glass house, I was in charge of many workers, and among them were my four sons, Paul, Charles, Ralph, and of course Jasper Jr. My brother-in-law, Harlan Bonifant, worked in the plant's fire department, and his wife, Jessie, well, she worked in the etching department, as well as my daughter-in-law, Doris. You could say that my family was well represented at the Cambridge Glass Company. I'm Rudy Winsick, and I started my career in the glass industry at the Cambridge Glass Company in 1923 at the age of 12. After my mother died, I lived with my sister and her husband, John Gates, who was a foreman at the glass house, so he took me to work with him. My first job was that of a coal boy, hauling loads of coal all day long for just a penny a load. Most days I would make 80 cents to a dollar, but once I made a dollar fifty. As soon as I emptied one load, off I went to get another. I did this for a few years before moving on to being a skilled gatherer, then presser, and blower later on. In my years at the Cambridge Glass Company, I guess you could say that I did a bit of everything. However, I was dismissed from the etching room in less than an hour and only lasted in packing for a couple of days. My small beginning at age 12 turned into a lifelong career in the glass industry. Hello, my name is Don Franz, and my family worked at the Cambridge Glass Company from its beginning. My grandfather, Jacob Franz, was one of the original glass workers who came to Cambridge from Finley, Ohio in 1902 to work at the new glass house. Jacob, or Hop as he was known to his friends, had sent his wife ahead sometime earlier to set up housekeeping. Jacob arrived in Cambridge by train on May 16, 1902, and he followed the railroad tracks to the Cambridge glass house. Jacob hoped someone there would be able to tell him where his family had settled, but the plant was deserted. He then heard his old coon dog barking from a house up on the hill, and by walking toward the sound, he made his way home. Jacob came to Cambridge Glass as a gathering boy, but eventually became a finisher for the company. Jacob's son Roy was born in Cambridge and went to work at the Glass House in 1921 as a gatherer in the hot metal department. Roy was my father, and I remember when I was 15 years old, Dad said it was time to go to work. He took me to the glass house, and I was told to wait to see if I would be chosen to work that day. It must have been my lucky day because Walkie McManus picked me to help in his shop. I worked my way through apprenticeship and became a skilled gatherer. On Saturday mornings, a group of men would work to reset the clay pots and the furnaces. If we saw someone's pants smoking as we were pushing the load of pots into the furnace, we quickly rushed to take care of it. We were just like a family. My wife, Betty, even worked in the etching department at the glass house for a while. My name is Walter Gugold, and I designed many of the Cambridge etching plates. One day, Mr. Bennett called me into his office and showed me a piece of lace that his wife, Martha, had brought back from her recent trip to England. Mr. Bennett asked if I could create an etching similar to the piece of lace, and I immediately began to make the drawings. Most days I worked at home in my studio because the noise at the plant was distracting. Etching plates used by Cambridge were made of high quality steel. The real artistry of etching glass occurs with the creation of the etching plate. Most of the plates I designed have my signature. The rose point etching was created in 1934 and was the most popular Cambridge etching. Hello, my name is Babe Calvert. I started to work at the Cambridge Glass Company in 1942 in the etching department, painting wax. On my first day of work, I was assigned to a nice lady by the name of Goldie Bunnell, who was to teach me how to paint the beeswax around the etching prints on the glassware. The mixture was a combination of varnish and beeswax and was very hot. I soon learned to be nice to the man who mixed the wax because it had to be just right not too thick or too thin. At one time, we had 300 paint girls. I eventually got to work beside my best friend, Virginia Wiley, and we always went to lunch together in the company restaurant. Howdy Baxter was in charge of the restaurant and the food was really good. 
The glass cutting department was located at the Cambridge Glass Plant, but owned by Herschel Hancock, who came to Cambridge in 1918 and stayed until 1954. In his 36 years at Cambridge, he created perhaps 17 to 1800 different patterns. The department employed 40 glass cutters, 25 by day and 15 at night. The cuttings were numbered and the pattern names were assigned by the Cambridge Glass Company or their salesmen. Next came the Great Depression, 1929 through 1933. Although the 1930s marked increased emphasis of etched and decorated lines such as Porsche, Chantilly, Wildflower, Rose Point, and other patterns, economic circumstances caused by the Depression kept production limited. In 1935, glass worker George Hitchcock reported, quote, Work in Cambridge is still very poor in all departments. We continue to hold on waiting for divine providence to brush aside the depression that is still running rampant and just as devastating as at any period of the past five years." End of quote. However, some of the Cambridge Glass Company's most popular colors and decorations were introduced during the depression and experienced great success. Amethyst, Carmen, Royal Blue, Forest Green, Heather Bloom, and Crown Tuscan were trend-setting in the 1930s and very popular with consumers. On August 25, 1931, a patent application for the figure stem line was submitted by the Cambridge Glass Company in the name of its corporate secretary and sales manager, Will Cameron McCartney. Of all of the Cambridge lines that originated during the 1930s, the figure stem line and rose point are the two most recognized as being Cambridge. The rose point etching was introduced on January 7, 1935 at the Pittsburgh Trade Show and was an immediate success for the Cambridge Glass Company. In 1939, A.J. Bennett sold controlling interest in the company to his son-in-law, Wilbur L. Orme, who at that time was general manager, vice president, and married to his daughter, Marjorie Bennett Orme. Mr. Orme became associated with the Cambridge Glass Company in 1915 at the Byesville factory, where he became manager before the plant was moved to Cambridge. When the two plants consolidated, Mr. Orme was made vice president and held that title until Mr. Bennett's death on February 19, 1940, at which time he became president. The death of Mr. Bennett removed from Cambridge's industrial structure a colorful figure, truly a man of courage and wisdom. Under Mr. Orme's leadership, the fourth furnace was built, which added 14 pots to the melting capacity of the factory. In line with the company policy of always looking to the future, in 1941, he installed a diesel engine in the powerhouse, something new in the glass industry. Another step forward taken by Mr. Orme was opening the plant to visitors. The company encouraged people to visit the plant and actually see how quality glassware was made. About 10,000 people annually visited the plant to observe for themselves how the quality glassware was produced. In 1940, Mr. Orme's oldest son, Arthur Bennett Orme, became associated with the company and in 1948 another son, Wilbur L. Orme Jr., returned to the plant from the service to his country. On January 1, 1949, Mr. Orme announced that his two sons had been elected to the company's board of directors and that Arthur B. Orme had been named vice president of the company. Another son, William C. Orme II, who was completing a five-year course in ceramic engineering, would also become associated with the company. Production continued under Orme's leadership and recovery came with the decade of the 40s. In fact, by the early 1940s, the three furnaces, each having 14 pots, were operating at full capacity. Only occasional equipment breakdowns, flu outbreaks, and periodic shortages of men due to World War II slowed glassmaking activities at the plant. Innovative glass colors continued, and an expanded line of crystal-cut decorated wares was introduced under the Rock Crystal name. Social activities and responsibilities of the glass worker during this period included first aid classes and drives to provide items for servicemen. On a larger scale, the employees of the Cambridge Glass Company accepted the responsibility of financing a service center for servicemen stationed at Fletcher General Hospital in Cambridge for a period of one month with the cooperation of the Cambridge Glass Company. The company matched dollar for dollar with the employees as they have done in every drive concerning war service. 
However, with the end of World War II, increased foreign competition, coupled with changes in the glass buying habits of consumers, became major obstacles to the continued good health of the handmade glass industry in this region of the country. Cambridge Glass President Orm attributed the inability to compete with foreign markets to low wages paid overseas and a lack of protection against the entry of cheap goods from foreign countries. Nonetheless, Cambridge's handmade quality and innovation continued. In the early 1950s, these traits were embodied by the introduction of a modern streamlined pattern called Cambridge Square that, when first revealed in the industry, won high honors for its design. Regardless of awards, it was deemed necessary to close the factory in 1954. It reopened again in 1955 under new ownership and operated until 1958 when the factory closed permanently. That the Cambridge Glass Company was humble in its origin is unquestioned, but through sheer courage, wisdom, and ceaseless diligence, an inexhaustive spirit of progressiveness and fortitude of purpose, it was built, developed, and was operated on sound business principles. An industry with less wisdom, courage, and ingenuity would not have survived with over 50 years of success. The Cambridge Glass Company factory was raised in 1990. A local historian documented the demolition and commented, quote, The demolition company thought if they cut the supporting beams inside the factory that the building would collapse. But that didn't happen. The old girl put up quite a fight and had to be taken down brick by brick. The end of a glorious era. <laughs>